next author is Anjali Sachdeva, and she is currently based in Pittsburgh now. My wife and I, uh, Pittsburgh is our second home because our older son uh, has been at Carnegie Mellon. He did his undergraduate, graduate, PhD there, and we go there frequently, and little did I know that every time Sushma and I would go to Pittsburgh, that we were going through the zone of extraordinary greatness. Uh, I have to tell you, when you see the praise that Anjali's debutante novel has received, it is peerless, beyond compare. And uh, the shocking thing to me is that she's totally unknown in the Indian community. Nobody in the Indian community knows that she even exists. And I think it's in some way, I'm sort of uh, <laughs> adding IAC on the back that uh, we have in Anjali a great find, a discovery, because she existed before we found her. But in the children's lit side, we have Veera. I mean, Veera is a 2019 Newbery Award winner that nobody in the Indian community knows. So to the degree there are some board members here of IAC, I think we are you know, playing a very useful role. And Lavina was with the press, will I'm sure note this, that there are absolute jewels that are shiny. So let me just make one comment and then I will turn it over to Anjali and then I'll come back with more in-depth questions. She ends her introduction. Uh, welcome, Dr. Mattu. He's the chairman of IAC. Uh, she ends her introduction to this extraordinary novel, a veritable tour de force, with, a, with this sentence. Wonder and terror meet at the horizon and we walk the knife edge between them. So with that, Anjali, why don't you take us through your collection okay. of stories and then I'll come back okay. and <coughs> have so, a few. Okay, okay. So thank you so much for, um, for having me here. I'm really pleased to be here. Um, I just wanted to talk, start off by talking a little bit about the book um, and how it was written, and, um, and then I'll read from a couple of the stories, and then I'll be happy to answer questions. So, um, as, as Rakesh was saying, um, I think this book hasn't, hasn't been big in the Indian community, partly because it's not about India or being Indian. And it was really interesting when I was, uh, I was upstairs listening to Vera's talk about The Night Diary, um, and we share a similar background. Where my father's Indian, my mother's um, white American, and so I've always grown up kind of between, you know, like between two cultures. Definitely had a lot of Indian culture in my life, but also had these other cultural influences. Um, and uh, so I was saying before the talk started, I, I feel like when I'm writing some of these characters, I'm picturing them one, may, one way in my head, and the reader may be picturing them a different way. But when the book was first reviewed, um, there was one Indian journalist who was interviewing me and she said, but none of your characters are Indian. And I thought, ah. Oh. <laughs> I mean, she's right, none of them are explicitly Indian. And I, number one, I thought, that has to be different in the next book. But I also realized how much, um, like how much of the characters' lives exist in my head and is not entirely in the story, right? That they may have some, um, culture or background or life experience that I have this whole other story of them in my head that is not entirely on the page. Because that's really the challenge with short stories, is you have 15 or 20 or 25 pages and you have to very concisely paint this whole world in that um, small space of time. And that's in fact one of the things I love about short stories. Um, when it was time to publish this book, for those of you who don't know who, who aren't involved in publishing, it is incredibly hard to get short stories published. Publishers would much rather publish um, novels 
because short stories are difficult to sell. And so when I was, um, when my agent was getting ready to send this book out to publishers, she said to me, um, I want you to write an introduction and explain what connects all of these stories, which was the introduction um, that you just heard from here. And I inwardly was just laughing to myself because I thought, but there is no connection between all these stories. I wrote them over a period of 12 years. Um, and as you'll see when I read from them, they're from very different time periods, um, different styles, different subjects, different types of writing. And as I was writing them, I really wasn't thinking um, what connection can they all have. I was thinking just what idea am I interested in right now that it's really compelling me that I want to write about it. So um, that was that was all I was thinking about as I was doing it. And when it came time to write the introduction, I sat down and thought about it. Um, and I realized that they did have a common thread, which was that all of them were about people, uh, <coughs> excuse me, grappling with these forces that were bigger than themselves and trying to find um, something to put their faith in. And for some of the characters, that something was religion, but for others it was science or it was nature or it was some other force that they were looking to besides religion. So that is where the title for the book came from, all the names they used for God, because I was just thinking of the different, kind of the different ways people define the divine in their own lives. So I'm going to read, um, I'm going to read from a couple of the stories, and I'm going to start with the last story in the book. Um, this is a story called Pleiades, uh, and it is, <laughs> it is written in the first person, and frequently after I read it, people will come up to me afterwards and say, I can't believe your parents did those terrible things to you. <laughs> Just to clarify, it is fiction. My father is a physician, but he's a lovely man and not anything like the parents okay. in this story. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to start from the beginning. <coughs> Pleiades. My parents were geneticists. They had a firm belief in the power of science to fix everything, to create everything. This belief was their religion, and they liked to proselytize as much as any born-again Christian. When they decided to have children, they saw the opportunity to share their faith in science with the world. They wanted to make miracle babies so unbelievable that people would stop and stare, their own organic equivalent of a billboard for Jesus. Their original idea was to develop an in vitro procedure that would create identical twins. But they decided twins weren't spectacular enough, not enough of a challenge. They settled on septuplets. One fertilized egg split into seven pieces made seven sisters, all of us identical. Pleiades, my father used to call us, after the constellation of seven stars. All the major networks were shooting footage at the hospital the day we were born. Protesters traveled from around the country to Los Angeles so they could picket outside with signs that said, seven deadly sins and Frankenstein's children. Even the doctors who delivered us expected us to come out with birth defects. Half a dozen neonatal specialists were standing by. But they weren't needed. We were small, about two pounds each, but other than that, my mother says, we were perfect. Our lungs, our hearts, our brain activity were measured and found to be normal. We all had a wisp of dark hair at the front of our foreheads and eyes that would turn from blue to brown. My parents didn't want rhyming names or alliterative names, <clears throat> but they liked to show off their knowledge of Greek. And so we were Leda, Io, Zoe, Helen, Cassandra, Vesta, and me, Adelpha, called Del. In the magazine photographs, my mother and father glow with a mixture of parental pride and professional elation. Without scientific interference, identical twins account for one in every 250 live births. Identical triplets, one in two million. Fraternal septuplets, one in every four million. And my sisters and I just couldn't exist. But science made us, and there we were pink-skinned and button-nosed, each swaddled in her own colored blanket, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, purple, a wriggling, blinking rainbow. 
The tabloids ran headlines like, Forced septuplets really alien babies, and test tube septs share one brain. After our first birthday, the publicity died down, although reporters came around now and then, hoping to do follow-up stories. In the scientific community, our celebrity never waned. Throughout our childhood, we took trips to visit scientists whom our parents referred to as our aunts and uncles. These people smiled at us and sometimes gave us hugs like real relatives, but they also liked to look at our skin cells under microscopes or watch us play together through two-way mirrors. My mother and father ran experiments too, and by the time we were six, we thought no more of giving a blood sample than we did of making our beds, picking up our toy, toys, or any <coughs> other chore. Our parents never told us which of us was born first because they thought it would affect our psychology. We reached the age of 11 considering ourselves separate in body, but not in anything else. I have heard that twins, even identical twins with a particularly close relationship, like to emphasize that they are still individuals, but we did not. There's an <coughs> old home video of us on the beach, eight or nine years old, and wearing matching gold spangled swimsuits. We move across the sand like a flock of birds in flight, each head turned only a fraction of a second before the next, so it's impossible to say where one motion ends and another begins. Perhaps it was the circumstances of our creation. <coughs> Perhaps we were not truly separate people, but parts of a whole, as a thicket of aspen trees all grow from the same network of roots. And even now, maybe it is no different. You were so easy, really, my mother said to me a few years ago in tearful nostalgia. You all liked peas, you all hated carrots. No one would use the pink crayons. Who knows what would have happened if we had reached high school together, been forced to deal with romances and social intrigues, and the possibility of attending different colleges. Perhaps we would have simply refused to be parted, clung together like a cluster of ladybugs in winter. Or maybe we would have adjusted, moved apart and away from another. But I doubt it. We were 11 years old, doing a jigsaw puzzle on the living room floor of our beach house in Santa Cruz. Vesta set a corner piece in its place, put her hand to the side of her head, and said she had a headache. We all looked at her and groaned. Headaches had a way of catching among us, even though our mother tried to tell us that was impossible. <laughs> A few minutes later, Vesta shook her head and complained again, and then she fainted, we thought. But we had a horrible, clenched feeling in our bodies. Leda put her hands on Vesta's cheeks, and Vesta didn't even flinch. We all went screaming for my mother. At the hospital, they said my sister had had a brain aneurysm, that she was dead. We wanted to argue, but we knew it was true. We could feel it. That night, we all slept piled on the floor of our bedroom, holding on to one another's wrists and calves and hair, terrified of losing one another. For months after that, we felt sick, but we thought it was just sadness. We didn't know yet that for us, there was no th such thing as just sadness, that our grief had a life of its own, an invisible mouth like a black hole that drew us inexorably closer. We were 12 when Leda got pneumonia. She never recovered. The doctors put her on every antibiotic they had, but she was dead in three weeks. Again, my sisters and I felt that same tautness in our bodies, that surge of poison in our veins, but we kept quiet about it. We didn't need to discuss it with one another, and our parents didn't understand anything. They were depressed, guilty, frantic for the solution they felt sure must be out there just beyond their reach. But that didn't touch what we felt. We were all thinking, without ever saying so, that one death might be a freak accident, but two was not. That we were all going to die. Mm -hmm. Reporters followed us everywhere. There were internet betting pools about which of us would die next. We started exercising, eating organic food, taking vitamins as if that was going to help. Another year went by and we lost Io. Anti-genetics protesters swarmed her funeral, 
glowing with self-righteousness. One woman carried a sign that said, Science giveth and the Lord taketh away. She wore a lime green sundress and stared at us through the wrought iron fence of the graveyard during the entire service, never making a sound. The remaining four of us began developing bruises in places we couldn't remember bumping. We were flown to specialists around the country, circulatory doctors, immunologists, gene therapists. We gave countless samples of blood and urine and tissue, were prodded and analyzed without receiving any conclusive results. They thought we had a new form of AIDS or had somehow developed hemophilia, but none of the tests supported these theories. Eventually, our parents moved us to New York City so they could set up camp at Mount Sinai Hospital and put all their energy into trying to cure us. They weren't medical doctors and didn't really belong there, but I believe there was a bargain struck, something to do with donating our coveted tissue samples, the kind of utterly calculated deal I didn't want to know too much about. I've always believed that the move had as much to do with getting away from their colleagues in California as it did with saving us. My parents were not so gracious in their defeat as they had been in their glory. When Zoe got sick, the rest of us began to consider desperate solutions. The three deaths we had suffered through were horribly painful, to be sure, but in a way, the most difficult, the most shocking, the most surprising, the worst thing was finding ourselves still alive the next day. We felt mocked, being forced to face time and again this brutal proof of our distinctness. We decided to bring it to a neat end for all of us if Zoe didn't improve. By then we were 16, old enough to be crafty, to filch chemicals from our parents' lab that were sure to be fatal. We kept them in little vials in our pockets as we stood around the hospital bed. But at the crucial moment, heart monitor flatlining, alarms sounding, frank, frantic nurses attempting resuscitation, we failed to act. Not one of us so much as moved a hand toward the poison. We still wanted to live in spite of it all. The next time, we didn't consider the plan again. We just sat silently by Cassie's bedside, kissed her tears, and watched her go. Then it was me and Helen, and we were terrified and sick all the time. We kept run wondering which one of us would die next wondering whether it was worse to be dead or alive and alone. We dreamed about the others. Sitting down to dinner or choosing our clothes for the day, we sometimes hesitated, waiting for them without realizing what we were doing. Their breath filled the room. Their fingertips were on our skin. Helen and I began to feel stretched, overfilled, oversensitive to everything. Loud noises frightened us beyond reason. The sound of our parents yelling or crying, both of which they did frequently, made us dizzy. Helen started having trouble breathing. We were 18, and it would have been the year of our high school graduation, but we'd long since quit school. For the next five years, she was battered by a drawn-out illness, waves of health and sickness lifting her up and throwing her down again. My parents whisked in and out of our house, like ghosts in their fluttering white lab coats, going back and forth to the hospital to examine cultures under the microscope, visit Helen, or meet with another doctor promising a cure. By then, I could have told them exactly what was wrong. The emotion and sensation of seven people condensed into two bodies was too much for the bodies to bear. But that was an explanation that wouldn't satisfy the rigors of science, so I knew it wouldn't satisfy them. There was nothing they could do about it anyway. Helen kept saying to me, what will we do? Her skin looked like it had shrunk, tight and shiny across her bones. There was nothing to say because we both knew the answer. We would not do anything. She would die and I would stand in the damp grass of the cemetery with no one to squeeze my hand at the graveside. My parents were around, of course, but I'd grown up without having to speak my mind, and I never knew what to say to them. Besides, I was finding them increasingly hard to love. I kept thinking about that protester at the funeral, years ago now, and an idea began tormenting me. Maybe there was only meant to be one of us. Maybe all that splitting had been a bad idea. I missed my sisters, but it was more than that. 
I could feel enough for seven people, as if my sisters wanted me to live for them. I wondered if nature, once she had pared us down to one body, would let me survive, or if it would just be worse for me in the end. My parents were desperate. They began planning to clone me or freeze me if I died, plotting it in their bedroom at night, never thinking I might be listening from the hallway. Despite their collusion, they hated each other. They both wanted me to forgive them for whatever mistake in their calculations had brought this on us. To forgive them on behalf of my sisters, too. Surely I could. Surely I was all of us in one. But I couldn't, or maybe I just didn't want to. I felt my sisters in me and around me, and I knew that whatever pain awaited me, letting my parents decide my fate was the worst choice I could make. Go, Helen said. Maybe you can outrun it. If one of us is left, that's enough. That's the end of the first section, so I'm going to stop there. Wow. Wow. So one of the interesting things to me about this story is I wrote it in maybe 2005 or 2006, and at the time, I feel like it was pure science fiction, and now I feel like this could be happening on the streets somewhere. Yes. Like, it's amazing to me um, the speed at which science moves. Um, and sometimes when I read this story, people say, oh, you must be, like, you must really um, have strong feelings against science. And in fact, yeah. it's quite the opposite. I love science, and I love reading um, articles about kind of cutting-edge scientific discoveries. But... Number one, so a lot of these stories have kind of a magical thread or a magical element to them. And often when I'm reading these um, studies about really advanced science, it seems to me almost indistinguishable from magic. Like, there are such incredible things being done at the, um, you know, the, the leading edge of scientific discovery. So I, um, a few years ago, I was teaching engineers um, how to write, which was its own challenge. Um, <laughs> and... Uh, Although, I'm uh, sorry, I should say my brother's here who's an engineer and an excellent writer, so I, <laughs> I, should, I shouldn't say this about all engineers, but the ones that I was teaching. Um, and, but one of their assignments was to write about what is their favorite development in engineering. And one of them was writing about um, 3D printing organs, which at the time I did not know was a thing going on out there in the world. And just that concept to me is like that you could turn on a machine and print out a heart or a liver or a lung was so magical to me. And obviously that's not a technology that has been perfected at this point, but that it's even as a possibility is so fascinating to me. And it's the sort of thing that I could imagine that you put it in a story now and 10 or 15 years from now, it's just utterly commonplace and there's nothing magical about it at all. So I'm very interested in that, that aspect of um, the interplay between science and belief and um, the way that things move from the magical to the mundane over time is very interesting to me. Um, let me see how we're doing. I have, I have a couple of questions. Yes, One sure. Is, uh, why did you pick up salmon case, not six or five? Is there anything behind that? <laughs> so, do you want to... No, I'm joking. There is a... There is a they are writing about the salmon case thing in their life. Right now, there's a true story about it. Oh, is that right? Papers, yeah. So this, I, I have not seen that true story. So let's pick up on the question of Dr. Matu. And I have another question. <laughs> let's, let, that, that one's a good one to start with, yeah. Dr. Matu. And I, I do want to do a shout out to Sri Srinivasan. And Sri, it's great to have you here. If you want, you can come in the front. Okay. So you mentioned that you don't have Indian themes yet in your writing. But here's the question. The Pleiades, the title of your yeah. story in India, that's the Kritikas, the yes. Seven Sisters. And they play an incredible role in the birth of, you know, Shiva's, yes. uh, you know, his seed is too hot for anybody to handle, and so they become the genetic carrier of, yeah, and right. give birth to Shiva's son. And so the question is this, through your stories, there is sort of a thread of death. Mm -hmm. Death is either right there or in the horizon. 
why is that? Do you feel that to be in that magic zone, you have to have one leg in mm. life and one leg in <laughs> afterlife? Because that seems to be a is pattern there? I notice. I mean, I think I am very interested in that, um, right, this kind of um, territory between the world that we live in and other worlds, right? Yes, and yes. I think the world after death is some form of that. Yeah. Um, and I'm always curious about that. But I will also say, um, especially with some of the older stories, so I heard a, there's a um, short story writer named Pinkney Benedict. He's a Southern mm -hmm. writer. Mm -hmm. And I heard him read a story once, which is about these people who, they decide to start a, a farm um, with miniature horses. And the horses keep breaking through the fence onto the neighboring farm. And the guy on that, that farm keeps saying, if those horses break through one more time, I'm going to shoot them all. And so in the end, they do break through one more time. And he comes out and sees them, but he has this moment of mercy. And he does not shoot them all. Mm. And when he was talking about this story, he said, if I had written that story when I was 25, he would have definitely shot those horses. Because I think there is a, um, just an undeniable tension, a dramatic drive that you get from dealing with a life and death conflict, right? Um, that, is, that is hard to create in other ways. So partly I think it was that, that especially when I was writing the earlier stories, I was still, like when I, was, when I wanted something really um, high stakes, I would go, okay, somebody, <laughs> somebody has to be in mortal peril here. Um, so I think that comes into it too, but I do, I do, um, I think also when people are in those extremely tense situations is when they tend to, um, it's, it's a time when people tend to have really intense realizations about themselves, and that also makes for interesting fiction. I want to cover a few more stories for the audience here, but Dr. Matri, a second question? Sorry, I, I had a serious question, yeah, yeah. and I wasn't answered. So Sam, I'm Anyway, thank you. Second, 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 My other question is that uh, whenever we write something, most of the writers, I can read the books and I can tell this is the same author mm -mm. because the style of writing and yeah. the writer comes through yes. in the books. Uh, even though you, try, you have said that uh, there is nothing to do with your faith or religion about this, uh, trying to interfere with procreation mm -hmm. by scientists. Yes. Are you sure about that? Or, oh, or, 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 certainly, or, uh, certainly. It is impossible to write a book without your own feelings and right. beliefs coming through. And certainly I am deeply interested in science, but I also have, I think, a healthy skepticism about it. Which is just to say, just because you have the scientific ability to do something doesn't mean that you should do it, right? And Scientists acknowledge that, you know, there are, there's plenty of, um, eth you know, boards of ethics and what have you in science, especially in the area of genetics and cloning, there are plenty of things that we have the capacity to do that at least in the United States, we do not do. Um, no, like, I'm a physician, so yeah. I, I mean, I, 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 No, no, so, so in that sense, I think my, um, my kind of concern about where some scientific discoveries may lead us comes through in the story. But I only want to say it's not that I don't believe in science. I'm a huge supporter of science. I don't know if that answers your question. Has, have you written this book for that skepticism you have about science? Or? No. And I, I would say this is the only story that takes that approach. Huh. Yeah. The other stories are much different. So let's move to the... Uh, uh, I mean, uh, I'll only cover a few. So... I think Ernest Hemingway won the Nobel Prize for the old man in the sea. Don't waste your time on that. Read <laughs> Anjali's Robert Greenman and the Mermaid. So, pretty much the same plot. Uh, there's this guy, he goes fishing in a trawler with other people. There's a shark. And then there's the Anjali Sajdeva twist. There's a mermaid in that story. Wow, what an amazing story it is. So profound, deeper than the ocean that he's in. And so 
I think in the old man in the sea, we know the spiritual seeking that the old man is doing. Even though he's going after the whale, there's a quest there, which is why he, I think the writer got the Nobel Prize. I'm curious in your story, what did this mermaid represent mm. to Robert? Mm. So in this story, Robert Greenman is a, he's a fisherman, he's a commercial fisherman. Um, and and the, I think the, his main defining characteristic is that he's just a very practical person, a very down-to-earth, um, kind of normal person. And he goes out on this trip, um, he can't sleep, he's out on the deck of the ship in the middle of the night and he sees this mermaid and he becomes sort of obsessed with her. Um, and I wanted to make it clear that the mermaid is not, like, in this traditional sense, beautiful. She's kind of fishy looking. It's not that, like, wow, she's gorgeous and I want to meet this gorgeous, you know, mer person. Um, but it's more that he, um, he just is obsessed because she's this magical creature. And I think, partly I wanted to think about, um, you know, so I read a lot of, um, Mag you know, writing with magical edge to it, and so often in that magical things happen and people just approach it as though, oh, of course, you know, this, whatever it is, this thing happened. And I wanted to think a little bit about if you were a very normal, practical person and something magical really did happen in your life, what, how would it affect you? Um, and I thought that it, it would probably be a very destructive thing for some people, you know, if you just can't um, come to accept it or if you, um, Mm -hmm. You know, it's so different from what has been part of your life so far. Uh, I think it could become sort of an unhealthy obsession. Mm -hmm. And that was part of what I wanted to explore in that story. But here's the interesting twist you put into it. Uh, this mermaid, this magical uh, manifestation, has a certain impact on Robert. Yet his, that younger boy who's on the yes. trawler, yeah. He too sees the mermaid, yes. and he's just left. Mm -hmm. So, uh, are you implying that for magic to happen in your life, you have to have some receptivity? Because clearly, the younger boy, <laughs> yes, he hits a mermaid, no big deal. <laughs> yes, and he harpoons a shark. So, <laughs> yes. so I'm curious, what else were you trying to suggest? There? Yes, because right, because he's a person. So there's this younger man um, who's. Who's out on the ship, and he's very from the beginning. He's always like reciting poetry and um, looking at the stars, and he is in this very um, much more open frame of mind. And so, yes, when he sees the mermaid, he's excited. It's not that he's just like oh, a mermaid, but he's he's excited. He's moved by it, but it's as though he's been waiting his whole life for something like this to happen, and it's finally happened, and he's just thrilled. Whereas Robert, um, it's it's more of a it's more it's simultaneously compelling and upsetting to him. And so, yeah, I was thinking about that, right, the different ways that people react to kind of magic in their lives um, and how, not just magic, but I think how being, having your mind be completely closed to any particular type of thinking is a dangerous thing. Let's move to another story. And the title of the story uh, is Killer of Kings. Yes. So to begin with, it's a very intriguing title. The character is, the principal character is John, and John's magic is that there is a muse that appears in his life that directs him to write. And the muse is a female angel. And there are two things that I'd like to have Anjali touch on. One is a very remarkable episode of a schoolboy who John notices when he was young. And the schoolboy's name is Reed. He's actually the butcher's son. And the only reason he's in school is that some philanthropist said, okay, I'll pay for your son's education. And this boy, instead of listening to his teacher, is gazing out of the window because this incredible hawk has just landed on the tree outside the window. The teacher sees that the student is not 
paying attention to them, so he says, come over, and he canes him. Boy doesn't care, as he walks out, his eyes are still looking at the window, and he's rewarded by this magnificent sight of the hawk spreading its wings and flying away. That's the vignette, but here is how Anjali describes it. A boy who cares more for the freedom to direct his gaze, mm -hmm. and then goes on. Now this sentence is very related to a very powerful concept we have in India called drishti. Drishti meaning the ability to see. And the seeing, the power of seeing, is the power to manifest the future. So it's very, without, maybe subconsciously. So let, before I go to my next question on it, what were you trying to convey out of that little episode that John remembers about read? What, and the sentence, this incredibly powerful sentence, I'll repeat it again. A boy who cares more for the freedom to direct his gaze than what the book tells him through the mouthpiece of the teacher. Mm. So I'm thinking of a few different things yeah. here. Partly, I am a teacher. Okay. And so I'm always conscious, or I maybe should say self-conscious when I'm teaching, of um, <laughs> like, is whatever I'm teaching the best use of my students' time, uh -huh. right? Um, sometimes they're definitely looking out the window. More often, they're looking at their phones. I hope that I'm more interesting than their phones, but I guess apparently not sometimes, right? So I, I, I am sometimes conscious of that, of like, if they're not listening to me, is it because, in fact, they're thinking about something more important, you know? So on that level, I think I was thinking about that. But also, um, the story is inspired by uh, the story of John Milton, um, the English poet, when he's writing Paradise Lost, which is his epic poem about um, uh, Adam and Eve and the Garden of Eden and this war in heaven. And, that, and Milton was blind at the time that he was writing the poem, and he did say that an angel came to him and kind of described it to him. But one of the interesting things about that poem, um, from, from a point of literary criticism, is that the first chapter is set in hell with the devil, and most literary scholars feel that that chapter is, is the best part of the entire poem. And it has all this language about, um, basically, like the famous line from that section is better to reign in hell than serve in heaven, right? Like it's better to be master of your own domain than to be um, controlled by someone else, even if it's in this lofty. So that idea was really interesting to me. Um, and I didn't, I absolutely did not recognize it as I was writing this story, but this, the story is very much, there's all these vignettes from John's life that are going to come together into this poem. And I do think that's very much the way my own writing process works. Like you're saying, like subconsciously, is this or that in there? So many things that I've read in my life, I think at this point I don't remember consciously anymore, but they have still um, built the person that I am and built the writer that I am. And sometimes when I'm writing, I do think those things find their way in there and I might not recognize it until much later and I might not ever recognize it at all but they still find their way in. So let's pick on that, because that actually brings me to the second question about this fascinating story, Killer of Kings. The muse is a female angel. Yes. She's a seditious angel, to use your word. Yes. She tells him to write about hell first. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, I won't give the story away. But my question is this. Are you subtly implying that Satan was a woman? <laughs> <laughs> this is fantastic. I've never been asked that question before. I don't think I was, uh, no. I don't think I was implying that, but I do think. So in, the, in that story, um, like, which is, in the, in the Milton's version of the story, a third of the angels in heaven join Satan and depart. Um, and so... I think I was just thinking about kind of when somebody takes a, um, 
a rebellious action, how does it affect the people who observe that rebellious action? So you see that with the angel, but you also see it in the section you were referencing from the classroom. Like when you have the student who says, I don't care if you're going to thrash me, I'm going to still sit here and look out the window because that is the most important thing to me. It's interesting to me to think about how that affects everyone around. Yeah. That, well, the killer of kings is mine. I mean, I read Paradise Lost, like all of you, it's a beautiful, beautiful poem. But just like uh, my comment on the old man and the king, the way Anjali goes beyond is truly an impressive testament to her powers of creativity. So let's talk now about a story that's very much here and now. Very much here and now. And this is a story about the Boko Haram, uh, people in Africa, uh, all of you have read about how they kidnapped girls, Christian girls, and how they converted them to Islam, and basically turned them into slaves. So that's the fundamental premise of the story. Uh, she does a masterful job of weaving uh, the story of these two girls who are from the same village. So. At the end of the story, is the power of a woman's curse far greater than any other power? The power of the gun, the power of a holy book, the power of a mullah? Is there a cosmic feminine power where these men are basically reduced to nothing? So the premise of the book is there are these two women who are, um, as teenagers, are kidnapped by uh, Boko Haram, and they are held captive for a number of years. They're forced to marry these two um, men. But over time, they learn from this other woman this ability to sort of hypnotize the men and make them um, do what they want, and they use that ability to escape. But they still have this ability, and they use it in other ways after they've um, escaped from their husbands. So, um, right, so they're sort of using it for revenge. To me, I, I had a lot of um, uncertainty about even writing this story to begin with, um, but what made me want to write it was I kept reading these stories about these young women who had been kidnapped, some of whom um, have escaped or they've been ransomed and they've returned to their homes, but even after they returned to their homes, um, they face a lot of prejudice, they face a lot of hardship, you know, both from sort of tra the trauma that they've gone through, but also they're sometimes ostracized in their home communities and things like that. And it was so upsetting to me, and I just wanted to write a story where they had, where I did feel like the women had some power, right? Like how, like what can I do to write a story that somehow gives them back some power? But then once I started writing it, you know, power is a complicated thing. It's not, it's not just easy to be like, okay, now you can punish everyone who ever did you wrong. End of story, everybody's happy. Like, it doesn't end that way. It's not, a, it's not, everybody's not happy in that situation. And I was really thinking about what would it be like to have the ability to punish the people who had hurt you so badly, um, and what would, what would be some of the unforeseen consequences of that. So I don't know that it's the, that their power overrides everything as much as, but I wanted those women to have some power in this story. That was the impetus for writing the story. I just wanted to give everybody a flavor of some of her stories because you haven't had a chance to read it, but I would encourage you to ask general questions. Nirmalji, yeah. go ahead. So, uh, you are comfortable with the concept of revenge? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so in my own it life... Does you to the same person who did wrong to you? The same oh, do, do I think it's right? No, I mean, I think at the end of the story, that's in fact what she is. I don't know that it's No, no, I know. Right. At the end of the story, that's kind of what she's asking herself is, is it right to do this? You know, like someone has done this awful thing to you, and initially you feel like all I want to do is have revenge, but there comes a point where revenge is not satisfying, and you yourself begin to become the same type of monster that you're right. trying to, you know. Because you are upset with the person for doing something that you want to do to the person. Mm. Yes. It's the yes. same right. thing then. Yes, and I definitely think these characters come to that um, moment. Yeah. So I haven't read the book, of yeah. course, um, but, you know, 
getting some snippets of your stories, how are they connected to your book title? Yeah, so the title, um, so that that story that we're just talking about, the Boko Haram story, is, um, this is also the title of that story. And within the story, it's because they are, um, when the girls are kidnapped, and they're in the camp with Boko Haram, and one of the things they make all the women do is recite the 99 names of God um, as a, as part of forcing them to convert, but also just as a sort of, I don't know, thing to show their power over them. Um, so that's where the title for that story comes from, but when I was putting all the stories together, um, I was thinking very much about this concept of what are the different things people worship in their lives. Um, you know, so, so, so I do think that some people treat science as a religion, right? Or some people treat, um, um, like, industry or commerce as a religion. Um, and you see that come up in different ways through the different stories. And so that was kind of the unifying thread is like, what are all the different things that people are worshiping in their lives? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, just listen to the, star, uh, the short uh, glimpses of the stories that you've written. Um, is the one I could gather was like you given. The way it starts is okay, but then somewhere down the line, there are always two perspectives that you bring in. Sure. You know, whether it was the seven sisters with the science and religion thing, yes. or whether it's this uh, revenge or good or bad thing. Yes. So, do you really end it with some conclusion, or do you leave it for the readers to oh. ponder on and say, you know what, uh, this is what it should be, or... So Kind, right of, kind of both. I mean, I try to bring the plot to a conclusion, right? Like, mm -hmm. the events of the story come mm -hmm. to a natural stopping point. But certainly I want there to be some idea that you're still thinking about mm -hmm. after the story is over. Because the question, like, the question that's being raised is, like, is revenge a good thing? I don't think, I don't think you could answer that in a thousand-page novel, much less, a, you know, a 30-page story. Um, and so I think my goal is just to present those ideas... Um, you know, like, as we're talking about it, we're talking very much about this is the idea behind the story, but hopefully when you're reading it, I think those ideas are not as obvious. It's more that you're focused on the characters and their personality and the things that are happening to them, and, and the underlying idea is woven in a bit more subtly. Because I do think one of the things that I love about fiction in general, but especially short stories, is by attaching these huge ideas to people and the daily events of people's lives, it allows you to experience them. You know, like I could come in here and say, like, let's talk about revenge. What is the meaning of revenge? And that's one way of understanding it. But living those concepts through the life of a character is a, another way to understand it and sometimes a more deeply felt way to understand it. Yeah, because it was like more of uh, these conflicts that we have, you know, yeah. science versus religion, revenge, good or bad, yeah. uh, you know, um, accepting magic or not accepting yeah. magic is... A normal thing that people in their daily lives would come across these yes. things, you know, on yes. and off. Yes. With no conclusive yes. answer <laughs> or a direction of thought. So your book kind of adds more to it. Yeah, I mean, I don't think, I mean, I certainly, this book is not going to answer for you science or religion. Like, there's, <laughs> I don't yeah. even think it's possible. But, um, no. but hopefully it gives people a new way to think about it, I would say. Okay. I think most, most of, societies and civilizations mm. have come to conclusion that revenge is not good mm. and should not be part of our thinking, particularly in the Indic thinking, mm. Hindu, Buddhist, Jain, Sikh mm. type of thinking. Order on the society, mm. how to manage the society, mm. even it may take blood killing of people, that's a different thing. Mm. Boko Haram is a bad thing, mm. you, know, you have to fight it, but not out of revenge. Mm. But you want to bring order to society, order to the world. Mm. And in Mahabharata, Bhagavad Gita, you may have read them, uh, talk about that very clearly. Mm. But revenge itself uh, is basically debasing yourself in, in our thinking and, and going down. Yeah, but, but that's the standard today. <laughs> no, that's beside the point. But I'm saying as, mm. as a concept, as a way of living. But I think what's as interesting. A principle of life. I think what's interesting is that even though we might accept that on a philosophical level, if somebody does something, and it, it, I, I always say to people, don't think of it in your own life, but think if somebody did something terrible to your child, right, or to your family member, it is such a natural urge to want 
revenge on that person, even if some, you know, like more um, mm -hmm. enlightened part of you knows that that's not the right thing to do, but like we still want to. But we don't allow lynching nowadays, so we take them to court. Of course yeah. you do. <laughs> so, so, so without giving yeah. away the story, so that we yeah. don't, uh, uh, we don't uh, uh, misinterpret the word revenge, basically in the story, what this girl does is basically she does, and, and you have to understand that the culture that's demonstrated in the story, what this girl does is extraordinary. Mm -hmm. She does triple talaq of the husband mm -hmm. and she banishes him. Wow. That's what the revenge is. Wow. The revenge is wow. the power to do triple talaq, which is yeah. unacceptable mm -hmm. for a wow. woman to do. That's what she does. So wow. I don't want people's thoughts to be a... <laughs> yeah, it's in nothing the wrong gory or, it's, right, not gory. Yes, no, it's yeah. the power of a woman to say, I too can push you away, mm -hmm. I banish you, mm -hmm. I banish you, I banish you. She does the total lie. But go ahead, I'm going to question. No, I, I wanted to make, uh, make a statement. You know, I think your, uh, uh, you say that they are uh, stories, are, uh, fiction, mm -hmm. but I think you're, you are an amazingly captivating uh, writing. Yeah. You're, you're, yeah. You're, you, know, re you were reading it there and, and you could internalize it and you could, you know, you're, it's very, very captivating and, and really, really proud of how you have been able to capture that. And, and it's not only um, uh, fiction, it's very intellectual. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, everything, what, whatever we have discussed. So I am incredibly thrilled and, and honored to to have uh, sat through and listening to you thank you so uh, amazing much. god thank bless you. you thank you you know uh, you mentioned how difficult it is to publish short stories yes. so <laughs> the fact that this book is published yeah. is in itself uh, a sign of a great uh, talent and honor and respect for your work and, and i really enjoy listening to your stories and and this conversation and what what better result than than to have people reflect on these fundamental issues you know, as a result of, of the story you tell. I'm curious about poetry and, and, and short fiction. You, yeah. you write about Milton and, and so on. Um, and the story, the narrative, as opposed to the poem, or, or, or the poems, just if you could just reflect on, uh, I'm just curious if you've also written poetry and the second question, whether you could just comment, if you could ask you to reflect on telling stories mm. through short stories or telling stories through poems, mm. uh, is narrative necessarily a separate category than the mm. poem, mm. Or, or, or are they malleable and just because of being cut out of those issues? So I've not written poetry, um, and maybe I should say I've not published poetry, I've had some attempts, you know, like in my secret books that nobody ever sees. Um, I do I do read a fair amount of poetry and I especially, um, you know, I'm drawn to the way that poets are able to describe things in terms that I, you know, that one would never, you know, like they will describe a tree or a piece of bread in a way that I would never have thought of it before and suddenly I see that common object in a completely new way. So I love that, absolutely. Um, and I do try to bring some element of that into my writing in terms of the um, like metaphorical, descriptive thing, passages in here. Um, I do always tend to be more drawn to things that are narrative-based. So, so there's plenty of poetry that is not narrative poetry, but I tend to love poetry that has some narrative thread to it that I can identify. Um, there is a famous... A uh, psych study from, I want to say the 1950s, I think, where they showed people this video of two, um, two triangles and a circle moving around the screen. Um, it's this, you can watch it on YouTube. It's just this old black and white video. Triangles move around, circles move around, the triangles kind of bump into each other and bump into the circle and move around the screen. And then they ask people, what was this video about? And 99% of the people say, oh, the big triangle was beating up the little triangle and then or and then they chased each other around to try to get revenge or like the little triangle is, or the little circle is the woman and this triangle is her husband and this triangle is her boyfriend you know they're telling all these stories about what are just geometric shapes moving around with no sound 
And then 1% of people, they'll say, what happened in the video? And they'll say, oh, there was a big triangle and a small triangle. They moved up and down. They describe it in purely descriptive geometric terms. So the point of that study is people are always looking for story in everything they see. Even when there is no story to be found, we are so such like story-centered beings that we always want to find that everywhere. Um, and I think that is certainly the case with me. Um, that even when I read something that's maybe not intended to be narrative, my mind is always functioning in the way of narrative. Um, if I'm listening to a talk on um, any subject, if there's some narrative element to it, I am more likely to pay attention or to absorb what's being told to me. I just think that's an incredible thing. Yeah. Anjali, I'm going to leave this uh, <laughs> group of aficionados. Yes, I okay. think they're all... There's a story in her book called Logging Lake. Mm -hmm. I won't tell you what it is about, but I'll end with a teaser that in that remarkable story at the very end, Anjali gives her take of what in today's day and time and world, partners are in their innermost yearning looking for from their partners. What are people looking for from their partners? It's just fascinating what her thesis is. The hallmark of a great author is that they can take what you are thinking about but dare not say, what you want to do but cannot do, and the author takes that and boldly takes you into those regions where you want to be. And I have maintained in my writings that fictive reality is a better carrier of truth than facts are. Because much like poetry, fictive reality and poetry enable you to experience truths at a level that is greater and higher than the mind, which can only process facts. Uh, I read a lot. I'm telling you, Anjali Sachdeva is a bright star that has appeared on the firmament. And when you read what uh, accolades she has received, uh, my wife often says this. She says, no, if anything is good, you say it's Indian. <laughs> so in your case, I'm happy to say, we are proud to have called you Thank one you. of our own. Thank you for coming and being part of the IAC family. We are going to now break for lunch. We are going to all assemble uh, for uh, at 4.30. And as I told Ravi, who will be the moderating the first ever poetry session inside IAC, that's the time for you to take us into the world of Nasha, intoxicate us. And humbly, IAC will do its part. You know, we can't do the poetry. That's for you guys. <laughs> but what we will do is we'll serve wine and cheese. So you'll be... You'll be enjoying the poetry with wine and cheese. Uh, please assemble at 4.30, and she will, Anjali will be there outside yes. to mm -hmm. autograph the books. Thank you so yes. much. Thank you very much.